private reasons, but uh, personal reasons. But um, he will be just in a couple of minutes. We can start uh, without him. Yeah, uh, as I was saying earlier to Sheriff, uh, I submitted a PR to the bundler spec uh, for a slight change uh, to be consistent with what ETH2 does, uh, especially on the gossip subdomain. Uh, they enforce uh, a strict no sign uh, flag uh, for messages. So that's something that we've turned on uh, right now. Um, and yeah, if uh, Shaf yourself or Dror uh, and Dan yourself as well, if you can take a look and uh, approve that, that'll be great. Um, that's one uh, update I had. And also I've been speaking to Stokes uh, who uh, came back to me saying that flashpots are not looking to uh, run a relay, uh, a flashpots relay on Cephalia anytime soon. They are more focused on uh, Holisky. So uh, he suggested that uh, we probably start testing on Holisky, uh, but uh, you have uh, told me that uh, Gorli is going to be running anyway for at least three months now. So we can continue testing on Gorli. And once uh, there's better representation of uh, MEV boost on uh, Holisky, we, could, we should probably switch over there. Hmm. Okay, uh, good to know that. Okay, so good to know. Um, yeah, so let's let's wait. Uh, let's wait yeah. until they yeah they have. Uh, so we we have made some changes. Um, if you could uh, if you could look at uh, certain uh, certain things in uh, in the entry point now, some of them are still. Uh, uh, public uh, PRs, uh, so we don't uh, we don't have all of them merged yet. But if you want to if you want to take a look at what we are actually going to uh, to introduce and what we th we are thinking about introducing, if you have uh, some feedback on it before we do it, uh, that would be that would be great. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, specifically the changes that uh, that I'm talking to uh, about is what we mentioned last time then uh, about uh, changing. Uh, changing the user operation on chain simply because we want to in, we wanted to introduce also paymaster gas limits. We we thought it would be it would be better. And uh, the other thing is uh, that we did that is also part of this change is basically changing how user operation is being uh, encoded and decoded, and uh, so that on chain you would have a different user operation than off chain. Uh, so just in order to save gas, for example, for cases when you don't have a paymaster, so you don't, you, so that you don't have to have all these uh, all these fields without uh, just filling the the call data just for no reason. Uh, so we basically have a packed version of a user operation on chain, and it should be very similar off chain to what it is uh, right now. So which okay. which of the two versions does the user sign? So the user should sign the, uh, the packed one. Okay, that is uh, that's how we uh, we thought about it. Unless you have a compiled reason to to do it otherwise, uh, but we just thought that uh, signing the the packed version would be better. Um, but. We are thinking about it just like, for example, think about how uh, currently a transaction, a normal transaction, is being uh, is being handled by uh, uh, by any wallet. So you have you have the call data, you have the like data to uh, gas limits, gas prices, and eventually you are not signing like this this struct. You are encoding it as an RLP encoding, and and you are signing that. Right, like you are first encoding, then you are signing uh, the, uh, the the transaction. So there is already a separation in terms of how the currently currently it, it is being handled. So we we thought about something very similar to that, that we don't have to have the same representation off chain and on chain to the to the user operation. Like uh, obviously off chain when it's visible to the users. Uh, it has to have the, set, the very same uh, uh, the, the very same fields that it's currently having, plus some other fields. But off chain, again, it's not uh, it's not the case. Uh, on chain, it shouldn't it, it doesn't have to be in the case at least. Um, that, that's yeah. it. That's basically yeah. That's that's what we thought of and. 
a key part of that is that we wanted to to save some gas, especially on cold data on uh, L twos, since it is like uh, we don't currently have like an uh, in house uh, compression. Though we are thinking about having some kind of compression, not necessarily on entry point, but just an extra compression to save gas. But uh, that that's just one step to do so. <clears throat> one thing to that I I brought up in the 437 Mafia group that I think is worth at least knowing before we go this route um, is L uh, call data on L2s is, uh, is eventually compressed before it gets sent to L1. And users should be charged for the compressed version. So every which is every currently not the these, case right that's the no issue. it is it is the case it is the case so, ah they are currently being charged on the, i thought that uh, yeah you know, not so, the they they uh they uh, charge the user for the uncompressed like the compression is no only it's for the for compressed the it's for the compressed ah, version really? so if you okay if you go look at i I'm, i can't speak for for other bundlers but the, the way that that our bundler works with with um regards to figuring out how much to charge a user for pre-verification gas on an L2 on Arbitrum, for example, is we'll make a call to the Arbit to the, to the pre-compile that um, basically tells you how much L2 gas to charge for this call data to compensate for the L1 um, security fee, which is the, uh, the cost of posting that data. Um, and on Arbitrum that actually will run the um i think it's the brokely compression algorithm on that and then we'll actually charge the user based on how many bytes are in the post compressed version um so uh, and so that's like that's how arbitrum works optimism i can only speak to these two um optimism's weird and i actually was talking to proto lambda and and a few others um kelvin um on the the team and they actually they actually do, do something weird they they apply a singular scalar value um to every set of bytes so they just assume that you're going to be able to compress any arbitrary piece of data to like 65 percent its size i think um which is is a little weird because some of these recent suggestions from the community have been like, hey, well, let's have bundlers actually compress the data first and then like before they before they go to the entry point, but as part of the the, the transaction so that then when the compress or when the, it just costs less for L1 call data. Um, and that actually is not true on Arbitrum because your data won't compress well the second time, but it is true on optimism because of this sort of hack because they apply the same scalar compression ratio to every value um i do expect that to change Kelvin from the op lab said that they're like likely to, to get something in the protocol that actually charges users for call data based on how much their actual data compresses and actually co costs on l1 so the my only comment with regards to kind of doing a lot of work specifically to save l2s for call data is just to compare it against the savings that you already get from doing just like a gzip compression on it um and you know because l2 call data the actual call data that you, is charged for running on the l2 network is cheap it's just the l1 call data that that matters so if, if that's post compression like removing a bunch of zeros from the uh, from the user operation by like packing these things actually shouldn't really matter that much to the end price, um, with a caveat that it really? does on optimism today, um, because optimism yeah, that's, how, to that's what it seems to yeah that's exactly what it seems that on optimism for example it uh, it does matter but you're saying that it shouldn't in the long term okay yeah and it doesn't that's, and it definitely doesn't on arbitrum like arbitrum in my opinion does this correctly where it actually it actually compresses your data to figure out how much to charge you um okay and they, they've I see, got a I see that, so, uh, draw is, has joined so draw do you remember the the issue the 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 expensive transaction issue that that someone uh, showed us was it was it on optimism if from what i remember it was on optimism right it was, it was base 
It was base. Ah, it was base, was, which is similar to optimism. That, mm. Now, there are a few very annoying things about this transaction. It's a very <laughs> heavy protocol. Dymo, they send JSON data. Uh, they also calculated the overhead of the transaction as if it was overhead of the ELC 4337. They call it 4337 uh, overhead or transaction. No, it is general, like. Yeah, it was because they're using web often, which is a ridiculous yeah. signature size. Yeah, I started to walk in, in to look into it. Uh, I talked with the answer about it. It was cornered. Actually, it was on our side. It generally, it used to be on our side. Uh, they, they cornered him to use this Dymo protocol for it. Uh, it was a bad example. And, and of course, they took a protocol which you can't compare. There is no Dymo without 4337. What we do need is a comparison of uh, apples to apples. Compare transaction on one side, batch bundle of a uh, 437 with or without compression, and uh, with normal transaction. Hmm. If you look at the, at the group, a little bit was on the mafia group of Vitalik, Vitalik suggested compression. He didn't continue about it, and I dislike his uh, over compression into one byte. Okay. Uh, because Bro, it, but did you hear the first part of the conversation? Uh, no, the I started, I, no, I joined only one. Uh, okay, uh, so just, just arbitrum. Just, you're right. Arbitrum does broadly zero, which is almost as compressed as it will be uh, eventually. Yeah. A little less. So from what from what Dan said, it's also going to be this case, like that case uh, on optimism. Yeah, I, so I, yeah, yeah, I heard it. Bit. I heard that, and I fully agree. What okay. they, they used, they are doing shortcuts as long as they can. Once someone will show them that uh, the statistics breaks because they use shortcut, they will stop using the shortcut. Uh, yeah. Links compressed. So wait, so so if we, I'm, the, the question that I had I had though is whether having a compression on outside is even necessary in this case because it seems it sounds like it's this uh, issue is going to be solved by uh, by the L2 itself. Like both on optimism and then base, because for what I understand, optimism is based on okay. optimism. There are three. May, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to count it. Uh, uh, the major uh, things uh, to compress. Zero compression is one. That's simple. Or doing broadly, which is almost the same, because there is within a transaction there is no compression except zeros. There's no repetition within transactions. Only between different transactions, and. Uh, my point in that uh, is that we cannot, uh, even if a bundler can compress multiple transactions together because of repetitive data between them, it is very, very hard to force the bundler to pay back this uh, saving back to the users <clears throat> because it depends which transaction got uh, into this bundler. Uh, yeah. it, it, it for a bundler. But the, the other two transactions we can compress is one is the stateful compression. There was a network error. Okay. One there was a yeah, okay. Uh, one thing is can be a, a stateful compression that compresses repeated data by keeping a key, uh, holding a dictionary on chain. I started to work on a, such a solution. Uh, uh, Vitalik worked on something else. Architecture-wise, it doesn't change much on-chain because the idea is to have a compressor. Sorry, on-chain you have a decompressor which calls entry point. So the entry point sees a decompressed data. It doesn't care if it was compressed. Uh, the account doesn't get, it doesn't see it at all. It only uh, the only matter it, it only matters for an account because the account when it performs gas estimation, the node should. Of course, it can ignore it. It should uh, do estimation based on this compression and let the client uh, use this compression. And for this reason, for any specific network, we need some standardized way of checking how well it will compress. So there's going to be some uh, de facto standard compression so that we can estimate gas correctly. Uh, but other than that, compression is not part of the protocol. So, and, and if you want, you can send transaction directly, bypass this compression, send it directly to the entry point. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree with with all of that, that like bundlers can play around with doing their own compression and stuff, and they can 
hack optimism and get this extra compression, like double dip in the compression ratio if they want to. But um, I, I don't think we should put any of that in, in protocol. Um, but I think the, the question that's that spurred all of this is that I'm, I was just digging into some of the motivations for doing this, this packing um, in the new entry point of, of some of these gas fields. Um, Cause it seems like if, if the only motivation was for L2s. Okay. Let's separate two things. One is a compression because we want to save coal data. The other is compression because we want to save gas. Because if transaction will become too large, we already, it already happened to us that because transaction is large, a uh, solidity uh, creates less and less uh, efficient code to handle it, to pass it around because it's big. You are passing these 16 uh, items, you need to use memory. You are shifting to a lower gear to use this transaction. So what we are, uh, what we need is a, a way to keep uh, validation, which usually doesn't use these fields. Entry point does, and native does, but accounts usually don't uh, directly access those all those fields. If I could remove some of the fields that account doesn't need or paymaster doesn't need, I would, but it's uh, so difficult to break user operation so that each component will get only some of the fields. It, it creates an overhead of by itself, and in, in addition to complexity. For this reason, we are still doing some packing to redo, so that we will not increase the number of fields too much. All the fields that are uh, clearly required, we keep them, we try to keep fields together, but it is to save gas, not a, a to save CPU gas and not cold data. It will save co marginally cold data and compress, of course, almost nothing. This is why we move it. A paymaster is not mandatory, so it seems trivial. It, it, it seems logical to pack paymaster gas fields into the paymaster data. Because if you don't have paymaster to have four fields for paymaster, we have paymaster, paymaster data, uh, and two gas fields. Now, why we need two gas fields? Uh, we need to document that, but there is no way to prevent attack on a paymaster if it doesn't have specific gas fields. The verification gas limit as it is today, uh, yes, is this to attack. Well, yeah, we didn't get to uh, yes. discuss it right this now, but I, I said it briefly that we want to introduce, like, we need to introduce these gas fields. So we need to introduce this gas field because of security issues. Now, yeah. we struggled a lot where to pack, how to pack them. Now, we need to pass all for all these paymaster fields, and uh, we don't want to pass four paymaster fields for all transactions that don't use paymaster. So we pack them into paymaster and data, uh, which means, yes, it takes a little bit to. Uh, uh, extract them. Um, so um, that's what we put them, uh, these fields into the payment center data. Uh, packing uh, the other fields, again, this is a, you might say it's less of an issue. We pack these two fields. Just a second, okay? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so yes, we packed uh, the the gas fields again. Gas fields are usually not used within a validation. We don't usually don't care about them to accept them. So uh, we pack them together, and there's uh, another uh, uh, another field that currently I think we discussed it that we added to the EAP that they might get added for completeness also for the ERC-437, and we will pack it again with the pre-verification gas. Again, not to increase too much uh, the fields for fields that don't get used at all by a uh, validation code. What what field is getting packed with pre-verification gas? Uh, there is pre-verification gas no. is uh, nominated in gas. Now, there are off-chain processes that are not in gas, they're in CPU. So you have to uh, 
denominate them something that is not gas. It doesn't fluctuate, so you want to denominate them in weight. Uh, all the, the off-chain calculation, aggregation, and such. Uh, this is what we call the uh, bundler fee. Yeah, the, builder yeah. fee. So, and again, it is something that the entry point will handle or the... What? Sure, we uh, lost you. We lost you for a second there. Yeah, I lost you too. Uh, uh, I repeat, what I'm saying is that these... Uh, just a second. Like a network problem? Anyway, the, okay. We packed, uh, the thing is that we packed both the verification gas limit and the call, the, uh, call gas limit, okay, to basically the, uh, for, uh, as one field to the account gas limits. And it just, th this change should only be uh, visible on chain, not off chain. Uh, you don't really have to, uh, to pack them off chain when you pass the user operation everywhere in the bundler just when you encode the uh what just when you actually encode the the on-chain call then you should pack them and send it on chain that's it so the it's the, it's only done for uh, probably for signature and uh, actually sending a transaction there is no other need for this encoding and well uh, i would actually it, yeah. i mean i would yeah. make the argument that the encoded version is the only is like is the canonical user operation version um that like I, and everyone needs to know about it because you need to know about it to sign it okay yes you, you need to know yes but the LP version yeah, yeah. Okay. lp is the encoded version but yeah application and off chain uh yes that's that's what i said before it's like if you think oh. about it okay wallet know the uh, it factors. The wallet know the RLP version only for signing. They don't care about for any other reason. They use the JSON file, the decoded version. Now, with account abstraction, it's a little more complex because there is on-chain code that reads the transaction, the validation code. But most of this field, it doesn't care about. All those uh, specific gas fields are checked and validated off-chain and validated by the entry point or by the protocol in the uh, native uh, account abstraction but not by the validation code of account or validation code of a paymaster. So they have to be there, but they can be encoded. And we didn't want to do RLP uh, on chain because then it will be a mess for all the fields you do care about. Yeah. So okay. this is uh, way in the middle. I think it makes sense. Um, and for the native account abstraction stuff, there's all you get RLP, so you don't have to worry yes. about adding extra, exactly. uh, extra fields. And we, we, we actually thought that Okay, it makes sense with the native account abstraction because either way we will have to encode some like to encode it differently, and so basically the change uh, from non-native to native should be the like changing the encoder. Like this is basically what uh, uh, what we we think that should happen. Now, uh, okay, yeah, okay. All right, I I think I think I I have enough context. Um, another just quick. Aside, I think I've made this pretty clear in a bunch of GitHub comments. I, I do think we have to find some way to have builder fee have a limit component to it to protect users from fluctuating prices. Um, because on Optimism today, users are forced to pay for like at least depending on how well they want their user operation to land on chain, they have to pay upwards of 25% more for call data gas, because if you price your, your, your pricing in an L2 gas, I, I guess it is a little bit better if you do, if you do it in way, because um, you can directly go from like L1 fee to, to way you don't have to, except for on Arbitrum, you you're, we're going to have to, uh, there's a, few weird things there yeah the adding yeah adding bundler fee will allow uh, okay the, the tldr i think that eoc force with seven will go some way to get a big a, a, a better a, a fair pricing but uh, a native eap will get will get it uh, all the way because force with seven uh, relies on off-chain conventions 
because we don't change the protocol. So a combination of a, a verification fee and a bundler fee, one in gas, one in way, we can define what is a good pricing for a protocol for a network. We say on Arbitrum, this is the way you should calculate these values. Put these values. It doesn't uh, fluctuate with the current network L1 gas prices because this is something that only the protocol can know. And we are not at the protocol level and we don't want to change the protocol. Like heavy, we, we could have an entry point for Arbitrum that does exactly that. Yes, we could. The question if we should, if it uh, that, mat uh, that matters. Uh, on a native AAP, this is easier because we will be able to add rules that when you are on Arbitrum, do the gas fee calculation in this and that way, a different way, which is uh, fair and uh, good for that network. So uh, th th that's my yeah. take. On it. Yeah, I think we, we it's better we to have discuss that entry point and push forward the EAP uh, on a network like Arbitrum, which obviously will adapt it earlier than uh, L1s. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Okay. Um, with regards to the the packing stuff, um, our, our, our and just in general the zero dot seven entry point. Um, just to get an update on that, where where are we at in the cycle for for the for the zero seven entry point um, in terms of like getting a list of all the changes out to the you know broader community, making sure that you know people have okay. a chance to get feedback in, and then um, okay, so I can answer that part. So we already compiled a list of changes. The thing that I need to do after compiling this list is actually. Uh, explain in each of them the rationale of why we made these changes. So that's like, basically have a proper release note. That, uh, that's something that I'm going to do uh, today, tomorrow. And uh, obviously, we, as I said before, we have several pending PRs that are changing the enter point itself that we would like to get some feedback on before we introduce them. Um, that's it. So these are like this is the blockers to to actually have releasing. Okay. Actually, if you look, if you look, at the, there are a few pull requests marked as uh, proposed changes for mm -hmm. v zero point seven. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should have published to say okay, we are looking for comments on that. The big change that uh, Shachap is working on, we need to add a description to explain the rationale behind it, and because it's only the change, so. Uh, what you see on chain. The explanation I gave here is something we need to uh, put in text okay. to make it clear. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'll, uh, so I'll, I'll forward that to the team to take a look at the proposed change PRs. Um, I'll look at it myself as well, and then would love to see that list of of changes when it when it's ready. So it seems like we're thinking early next year for a zero dot seven. Readiness. Yeah, it's early next year. We need we have the months to uh, for an audit, so we need to uh, we have a deadline on that. So it's gonna be okay, probably February. Yeah, okay. sounds good. Sounds good. Cool. Um, um, yeah. Should we talk about P 2 P stuff? Um, okay, I I think we can talk about a few of these things just async in the in the PRs, but a couple. Um, Couple things to to bring up. One, um, I this this mempool subnet stuff. Um, should we just remove that? I don't think it has any meaning at the moment. Um, it's currently in the in the ENR description, but um, as we discussed last meeting, um, there was a proposal in the discovery to use that as like the you would take the mempool ID mod. The number of subnets and put your bit field in there, but then we discussed just dropping that entirely, and not, and we're just not going to use that for anything. Um, I, the mempool subnets I don't think have a have a meaning at the moment. So, is anyone against just dropping that? Not at all. I think yes, actually, I agree with you. I had a suggestion. Wow, I forgot it when I reviewed your stuff. Is in that put the boot ENRs into the mempool ID into the mempool. Uh, a definition file Subnet. and if, if you put it that it's not a complete solution because it means like if you change the boot ENR you need to 
a different mempool ID, but uh, it does mean that you have a, a very simple two-man uh, propagation mechanism for the boot ENRs for specific mempool ID. Yeah, cool. All right, I, I, I think that makes sense. I think I'll just remove the whole mempool subnets field because um, it, no. it doesn't have any meaning currently. Um, so yeah, I think we both are talking, uh, you and Drawer are talking two different things. You were referring to mempool subnet and Drawer is referring to mempool ID, uh, including the boot ENR. No, the, the reason for the, me the, the mempool subnets is a mechanism to simplify when I boot, how do I, how do I search and find a bundlers with the same uh, mempool as me? So, Correct. The idea of uh, Dan was, given that there is a, a one set of boot ENRs for the entire uh, 447 uh, range, I need right. to pick all those that support my uh, mempool. How do I find them? So we right. added a mechanism to reduce by 1,000 the number of queries I need, which is great. Uh, yep. I gave a simplest uh, solution and says, OK, each uh, mempool uh, someone defined at least some of these bundlers will be defined as the boot ENRs. So the boot ENRs of those bundlers will be written inside the mempool info file. They can overlap yep. with others. And now I collect all the mempools I care about, collect all the ENRs. There's few canonical and few specialized of some of the other mempool and contact these boot uh, mempool IDs, uh, uh, did, uh, boot ENRs to contact bundlers. I'm trying to think about it now, but I think I still have a problem. Let's think about scenario there, 1,000 uh, bundles at tall, total, and a boot ENR for the canonical, like one, two, I don't care how many, and like 10 other bundlers of, the, of some mempool, okay? So I, I now contact these two boot ENRs. Mm -hmm. One for the canonical and one for the alt mempool. Now, this alt mempool uh, boot ENR, how do I find more uh, bundlers that handle this uh, uh, mempool? You, no, yeah, you would get that from the peers uh, that you get when you connect to that boot ENR. Yeah, I so know, I think... but, but, but his peers. Yeah contains also many peers that are not part of this mempool ID. I still- Yeah, you have to connect to the peer. I think the only the, the only way to do it currently it. in the protocol. Yeah. So and I, th I think still... like we discussed this two weeks ago um, and we decided that currently in the P2P mempool, it, it's, not, it's not currently a problem that we need to solve. Yeah. It is okay today and for the foreseeable future to just connect to all peers and ask them what mempools they support. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we find that to eventually, if if and w and potentially when we find that to be a problem, then we can add this extra these ex extra hints to the ENR or that and ex add to this protocol and a future update that lets us kind of simplify the or optimize this approach to make it easier to find yes. okay. specific mempool support through the ENR, through discovery. I agree. So yeah, we can um, remove mempool subnets or whatever the cool. field is. Yeah, and just to be clear, the way, you, the way you figure out what another peer supports is through their, their metadata, which is the supported mempools field in the, yeah. in the metadata response. Um, okay, uh, so that is status metadata and ENR stuff and then uh, the pooled user app hashes um, just to be clear here so um, I, I, I do remember this conversation that we had about the more flag versus the total count um, yep. I want to I, I, I'm okay with using the more flag but I want to be very clear that the more flag is actually only on, like the the total set of of user apps should only that you're sending to a peer should only shrink like there yeah. shouldn't be this like constant like you know oh I, I received more user apps and i'm sending more to the peer yeah. like it should only be used to just reduce ones that have already like have been mined within this process um, i think my thinking but is that when i query another bundler for a set it generates a response now 
and it doesn't send it all in once. Yes, it sent me the first bulk, but the response is cached in memory. I can uh, now iterate through this large response. It is not that the response is recreated from scratch, so that let's say that some entries will become stale because they got mined, they get removed from the network. It's okay that I get stale numbers because even if, I, let's think about a, a timing issue, I got fresh results, but by the time I try to query them, they can be stale. So when I make a request, any hash I receive might be stale. So it doesn't matter if the cache responds return with stale entities, uh, entries. And missing entries, again, it is a, it's a timing issue. If I make a, a bulk request and I re they return only 99.9%, .9%, it's still okay. Yeah. No need to uh, okay. handle these edge cases to add complexities to that. Yeah. So I think the, the more flag is the correct thing there. I will make it clear, though, how to use the more flag, which is basically like the, 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 the local cache that the, that the pooled user ops say, caches. Instead of count, Instead of offset, you, you added a Boolean flag? I, I don't know, what is the more flag? Yeah, yeah so it's, it's basically boolean. like, it, it's a Boolean. Um, so essentially the way this works is peer requests pooled user app hashes from you, you create an in-memory cache of, this is, this is the set of user app hashes I need to send to this peer. You send as many as you, as you, you can, um, remove those from your cache that so you already sent it to this peer. If there's more, you add a Boolean in the more flag, and then the, the user eventually then requests, hey, give me more. You look at your cache and you say, oh, you have to look through. And at that point, you have to say, oh, do I even have all of these anymore? Because I might have removed them from my mempool because they were mined. Um, and then you just send whatever you have. And if there's more, you send another flag that says more. Um, so you, there is a little bit of a like need for a state for state on the, I guess, in the server in this um, scenario. Um, but I, I agree that because that, that list can shrink, we never, we don't want to use total count because we don't want the user to the, the client to be dependent on that total count. It's just more, it's just a flexible value. Yes. But if it, if it is a flag, if it's the more flag, then you require in the protocol to define the server, to create a cache. It's not a suggested implementation. It's the only implementation possible create a cache of the full response, keep it in memory because you will get flagged more, 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 more to get portion of it and remove it only after you send it entirely. If instead it is not a flag, but I call it a next marker, but it, it can be an offset, but that's an implementation issue. It's a, a cookie that say, give this, the server says, give this uh, back to me as a, as a more flag then the server can use different implementation that uh, behaves uh, the same let's say okay. user ops i mean a database sorted by user id and i return the first 1000 and now the next time you call i don't need any cash i will give me the number i gave you which is a uh, 1000 i will give you everything from 1000 or with a slippage one yeah. or two more Yes, it could be that I return you several entity multiple times. It could be that I will skip some, but it doesn't really matter. As long as it's consistent and you will get 99.9% of the database in this request, I can, I as a server can do without having to uh, cache all the responses back in memory. A simple could having a cache. Uh, having a cache could lead to other problems, right? What if those user ops were already processed in, uh, during that period, then the bundler would simulate it and see that it's already on-chain and uh, could affect the reputation of uh, the peer? No. no, no, no. It will not affect the reputation because think of it the other way. Let's say I query you, you return me a list, mm -hmm. but mid-air, by the time you are sending me this list, before I started processing it, one of these mm -hmm. user version got processed on chain. Yeah. What I'm saying is in any way that when I get a bulk of responses from you, I cannot assume that they are all in memory. It could be that they get dropped. It could be that they get mined. These are, and both of these cases are okay. I, I need to check. So I don't want to be, to protect in the protocol 
while the receiver have to check them anyway. That's why instead of a more flag, I'd say like it's a hash saying there is more, whether it is the first request or repeated request. And you know what? Maybe all implementation right now will use it as a flag, yes, no, and uh, say, OK, give me one, be because it will implement the cache. I don't want to bake the implementation into the protocol. That's what I'm saying. So okay. what, what, what's your suggestion for the, the field? Just bytes, like something arbitrary? What, what do you think the field should be? It's, it's a more, more context. Not giving a context, meaning it is the first request. Returning uh, a more context from a previous response, saying, I am repeating, I'm continuing a response you gave me earlier. The meaning of this value is defined by the server, not by the receiver. And yes, so we could have that it is indeed the value it returned earlier. Because if you just put five and the never, server never sent it, the response will be un undefined because it's not clear what will be the response. Think of it as kind of a HTTP cookie. Okay, the server knows what it means for the next request. The client doesn't. But okay, knows. so you're, you're saying that got it, got it. So the server should respond with some basically some random value. Like it could be just like a randomly generated value that the client can then server respond. Server generated with. value. I don't care if it's an offset. It's a random value. It's a cookie containing other. Okay. For the client, it's yeah. random. It's opaque data. That's fine. Yeah. Actually, it's a cookie. I, 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 yeah. it, it shouldn't I, be believed. I, yeah. I, I like that idea. So it's it's not a more flag. It's just like a server server cookie. I don't know what to exactly. We probably shouldn't use yeah, server cookie. But I, 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 how more how the server yeah, yeah. uses that to, to identify the remaining uh, it's set of yeah. user options is up to that yeah. in implementation. It's like yeah. a one pagination one, key. There is um, one. There's one. Yeah, pagination key. There's one value that is defined. This is the empty. If I, as a client, mm -hmm. send a request with an empty, it means this is the first request. Yeah. I don't have any yep. previous request. <clears throat> All right. And, yep. and okay. we, can say, we can say one more thing about it. If I send a, an empty a key to the server, the, it means that I don't have any pending request from the server because each receiver is allowed only one context against the server. Okay. So the server may drop any previous caches for other yeah. reasons. Because so shall we then what one define the data type? Sorry, go on then. Well, I was gonna say uh, that there's also probably the termination case where the server doesn't respond with a key, which means don't ask me anymore. <laughs> like anymore. you're gonna yeah. have like. Uh, uh, okay, maybe there. Okay, maybe there's a key saying last. The response can be this is the last ah, which can be empty. Empty, so, empty. Yeah. So if there's a server response empty, then there's the nothing to send back for the context. Yeah. The next yeah. response would be a new one, a fresh one. Yeah. I will say too, like the way that uh, Dev P2P works, they don't even have this concept. They just they just cap it at forty ninety six. They just say like, the best we're gonna do in in this is just return forty ninety six hashes, and that we're just gonna sync forty ninety six hashes. Um, and the, and we're the not even gonna try anymore. That. They say, they say there, there is a limit that they can say only up to 1496, and there are more, you will not get more than 1496. You will not get 40, uh, more I, than 1496. Then, from what I understood, initially you wanted to take example of dev P2P, but then I saw that, first of all, it's pretty much deprecated and they are moving to lead P2P where, wherever they can. No? Isn't that the case? Um, I so, so there's a difference. This is what I'm talking about here. Lib P2P and, and Dev P2P is like a vertically integrated like P2P definition and like its message types. Whereas like Lib P2P is our P2P implementation, then we've defined message types on top. I think they're gonna be moving ideally in the future to Lib P2P as the P2P implementation, but they might keep their same message types. Um so okay. I'm not sure exactly how they're gonna do this with the with the even if they moved it on to P2P. Hmm. OK. So OK, it makes sense. Um, just, just take an example of the P2P. I'm not sure that we uh, that we have to to follow suit, right? Like that we have to yeah. uh, be comp I, comp I like the idea uh, that I, I like George's idea because it, it it's then just like server server implementation if they want to return a pagination key they can if they don't and they just want to return 4096 they can and the client can either choose to 
use pagination keys if they want, or they can choose to just say, yeah, the first request was fine. Um, I'm pretty confident to be completely honest that in our implementation, I don't even know, at least for the MVP, I don't even know if we're gonna implement this um, because it's very, I mean, we'll implement the like the server side, but I don't know if we're gonna implement this initial syncing because it's, at least on L2s where you have fast block times, it's not even that, yeah, you're never going really, to pick the four nine to six limit. Yeah, you're really only ever gonna you're really only ever gonna pick up like user operations that are like underpriced that are just like sitting in the mempool because they can't get included in any bundle, um, and so you're not even picking up anything good. <laughs> so I think maybe in the future we'll, we'll implement it. It's good to have in the protocol, but I, I don't think it's it's the the biggest thing. Um, let's move on. We've got ten minutes left um, to the gossip stuff. Um, the Question that I wanted to talk about there. Um, there's two two ones. Um, Joy had a comment on removing the the entry point address. Um, I'm fine with having the entry point address in the in the request, but my understanding is that a mempool specific mempool ID, which is the the gossip topic, is directly related to an entry point address. So if you're receiving a message on a particular topic, like libp2p will tell you, hey, you received this message on topic A. Topic A is associated with entry, like entry point X. Um, and so you do know you have that information somewhere that you specifically received this user operation for entry point X. Um, so I'm not sure it needs to be in the message type itself. And the uh but we do say that I can, when I receive a message, I don't know which mempool it was received. No, you do. You, subscribe. you do, because you subscribe to a specific message, uh, a gossip top topic. So, yeah, you we know. Said, we said we're going to uh, filter it out. Like, if I'm subscribed to a uh, 10 mempool IDs and a message was sent over five of them, I will receive it, probably I will receive it once. So, so yeah, the, 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 there's there's two things here. They all have the same enter point, no? So what, what, they so what would have to have the same enter point. I will receive, yeah. Exactly. What you're saying, I received a message on a mempool ID. It could have been sent also on other mempool IDs, but they all share the same entry point anyway. They have, they have to, to right? otherwise it's not the same mempool. Like, otherwise it can't be the same user, no? Like, what does no, it mean? I, I, I'm thinking about layering. We have a layer of mempools and message processing. Now, lip 2 p you receive a message from a topic. Yeah. On the system, because of caching, I receive a message and I know it is one of several topics. I thought of ignoring completely on which topic it was received. Ignore, I received the message, clean slate. I check now, which I have to do anyway, on which uh, topics that I know it, uh, it's, it's relevant. What you're saying, I have to leak some information from the topic I received and then in order to process this uh, user operation, and only then I can find what topic or other topics it is good for. It's, it's information leaking between layers. I agree that it is there. The inf you, you could yep. get this information. Because I, one more thing, I think I wrote it somewhere. Uh, when you uh, receive a entry point ID, or even uh, I think the uh, even mempool like this in some cases, we don't have to push the uh, to, to pass the full value. Like like passing thirty two uh, bit for entry point, a hash of an entry point is enough because it's not that a bundle will support every entry point. It will support n small n like one yeah. two entry point so you could pass in any uh, shortcut yeah. yeah to be completely honest like also you know we're all sitting on relatively like the, the a few bytes here and there and in, in the, this is p2p like it's not like we're sending kilobytes around the network we're just adding you know an extra yeah. 50 bytes or something to these these things i'm I'm not too worried. I, I think we could add the entry point back to the message. It just felt like redundant information to me. But if if the I, I do understand your point, Dror, that it is I, I believe the way that people should be that bundlers should be treating these messages is they should 
they should forget what topic they receive it on because they're going to re-simulate it anyway and figure out if they they want it or not afterwards. The way, um, the way so I would, think, I would think about it. I don't care if a message was received over P2P or over RPC. Yeah. This process is just the same. Okay. That, that's fine. Let's set it back. Um, I don't even think we needed to use the compressed version. I'm okay with just using the full 256 um, alongside it. Um, again, like, it's. I don't think it's that big of a deal to have to shave those bytes off. Um, uh, okay. Related to that, um, there is still this issue, and this is unsolved, and in in lib P2P and um, is unsolved in, in this PR that if a user operation matches multiple mempools and you are subscribed to both of those mempools, you will receive the user operation on both of those mempools. Um, so there is no deduping. And this is, this is specifically because, um, to get around that issue with lib P2P where you actually, you actually need the lib P2P protocol implementation needs to needs to view those two messages as different messages, or else it won't send it to to all your peers. So, yep. so I think that's fine. Uh, also, for now, like because the chances of a user operation matching like a crazy amount of of mempools is relatively low, and the bundler themselves is taking on the the extra overhead of just subscribing to multiple mempools. So if they're subscribing to multiple mempools, they should know that, hey, I'm going to have to handle this potential duplication of, of network messages. Um, it's not like they have to do extra simulations. They'll know they've already received the thing. Um, they'll just dedupe it at their own layer. Um, the one caveat, I think, oh, yeah, the one caveat is everything matches the canonical mempool. Um, so if if you're, I guess, no, sorry, the, 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 yeah, the, one, the one caveat is like, um, if this user operation matches the canonical mempool, it, it doesn't, like, even though it might match the USDC mempool, like it, it might pass its validation rules, like it doesn't use USDC, but it's on, it's, it's part of that mempool because it, it passes that, it, we wouldn't send it on that. We would just send it on the canonical mempool. I'm, I'm not sure if I described that correctly. I'm, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. If you send it to a canonical mempool, there's no reason to send it elsewhere because everyone should yeah. listen to the canonical mempool. The problem that is that we have a definition of canonical mempool. That bothers me. Why? Because <clears throat> let's say we have entry point A and now we have entry point B. Okay? We now have two canonical mempools. Yeah, they're, they're separate. They're How is that an issue again? The, we're talking about the separate, like separate uh, transactions, separate user operations. Like, why is that uh, an issue? You can't have a possibility. The issue is that canonical mempool has a, a has a special meaning, and by requiring the protocol to know the canonical mempool as a special one. It means that if ever we have another mempool that uh, is uh, quite ubiquitous and everybody wants to, uh, to use it, <clears throat> and then that mempool will not have that optimization that we baked into the canonical one. I want a pro I wanted a protocol, I don't think we can get away with it, but I, I wanted a protocol that doesn't define the canonical, but it's just incidentally one that everybody supports and uh, it's optimized and done, which means that if there are some mempools that becomes very ubiquitous. Let, let's say, okay, we'll probably have a USDC mempool, and uh, later we'll maybe for several other very important tokens, uh, then you will have like, not one canonical, you will have like a multiple, uh, multiple yeah. canonicals. Now, the definition with the canonical right now is that if it passes the canonical, you send it only in the canonical, and if it doesn't pass in the canonical, you send it on all mempool that uh, it passes. It passes on. Yep. So, uh, it, which means even if it doesn't use any special meaning in those uh, alternate mempools. Uh, uh, 
so yes, if if there, if something doesn't, I'm trying to think. Uh, okay, let's say we have a rule that defines something about tokens. Okay, so that a mempool that doesn't use that any token of such token will go through the canonical, of course, and uh, a user of that requires. Uh, yeah, and uh, and users that use any of those uh, tokens will pass through all. I'm trying to think if there is a case where it will pass through multiple non-canonical. Sorry, it's hard for me to think in English. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I need to write it down. If that's it. Let's let's take it off offline because we're, okay, okay. we're, we're, we're yeah. out of time. But um, okay. yeah. I just wanted to point out that that is that's yeah. the mempool deduplication stuff is not solved. So there there needs to be yeah. some way of limiting this spread using some of my, like and and maybe there is a way as I think Jor was getting at that like. You can figure out by looking at by simulating user operations specifically which alt mempools it would only ever pass on and just send it to those. Yes. Yeah. Um, There's uh, also an action on me, Dan. I I was supposed to put you in touch with the guys from Protocol Labs to see if LibPuTP themselves can provide us with a solution. I'll probably uh, do that. I I it completely slipped be, my mind. I'll put that would be great. And sorry, the one thing also to add, um, not just just because it's in, in my head now, um, we are going to have to have, assuming that the P2P layer is going to ship on top of the 0 0.6 entry point, um, the user app the user app container in P2P is going to be different for the 0 0.7 entry point. Um, it will be, yeah which there's nothing in the in the current spec what that you, like what you call container uh if you look so at the, the lib p2p spec at the bottom there is a, a a container defined for the user op i think we need to change that in accordance with the latest uh, user op spec well i i think i think this just kind of addresses like the the need that that container might need to be it, it's kind of going to be it, it needs it's going to be different potentially based on what topic you're on you know like if you're on a topic that's for a specific entry point that user app container might be different um or in the future like for the native native you know assuming that we have we use something very similar here that like the the that container might change so that's another thing that we don't have to figure it out right now but we should probably add something to this existing spec that lets us change that container for later entry yep. points um which is going to be relatively annoying and, I, and maybe there's like a one of or like a, a way to to say it could be one uh, of these there is this concept of gossip type i guess uh, i'm not sure but this may be uh, this may uh, have this problem okay what was Let's that look into it. Yeah, gossip type, gossip type. Gossip type, okay. Yeah. Cool. No, they will have different messages. User of uh, version 6 is different than user of version 7. 7, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's what we're going to need to define is like we're going to have to either have a completely new message type that's like user up for entry point. Entry <laughs> point, yeah. New, new, I don't know, new entry point. <laughs> uh, but the entry point oh yeah you're right the the container would change again yeah there is also a um this this is kind of uh, we don't necessarily need to define the user up container in this like we could just use the on chain representation and just serialize bytes through this protocol because nothing in the protocol actually looks at the the user app like it, the user app doesn't, this protocol doesn't necessarily need to define how you encode the, the user app sites. Yeah, we 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 could just say, hey, this is the this is this the RLP encoded or whatever. The I don't know if it's RLP, but it, it's the some 
the, the on-chain encoded version of this. Because right now we're using the SSZ encoded user app, which is only ever used in this P2P protocol. Like we could just say, hey, this is the whatever the um, on-chain encoding of this is, whatever you sign, what, or the RLP, I don't know. What's the right encoding to, to use here? Yeah, binary. Keep it binary, not define it in the protocol. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that, that might, That's that important. solves this problem. It solves yes. this problem. Do we ever use the hash, the user of hash in this or not? We definitely should send that. The hash is the identifier of the of the user up. Um, actually, do we use it? it their message sure. ID is message ID has extra stuff in it, so it's not just the user up hash. Um, Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, maybe we we make it a, we just a binary. This code. is offline. Yeah. Uh, async. Yeah. Got to got to drop. Yeah. Okay. We need to do that. Cool. Cool. So so, so yeah, I think are, the, are we not? Yeah, I was gonna say we're not meeting in two weeks. Uh yeah, I thought most of us are away on twenty eighth, right? So I thought uh, we would reschedule it to probably second week of Jan, uh, unless you guys just say, I mean, want to meet. Uh, on the 28th yeah I'm, I'm on vacation that week so same here so are we happy no. for meeting uh on uh, in the second week of january then okay. january 11th uh yeah as per the current schedule yeah it's on 11th the next call is on 11th on the second week uh, since we have audit on mid uh, January, I think okay. it will be a bit uh, pressed. <laughs> it's very easy for me to say now it's okay, but uh, I think that by <laughs> we will find out that uh, we have some urgent stuff. No, no worries, Zedro. What we could do is probably I'll uh, I'll ask around again in the first week of January, and then accordingly reschedule it if required. Okay, first week might be a little better. Okay. I'm okay moving it to the first week of January and doing it on the fourth if if that works for other people. So three weeks from now. We can we can tentatively or even just move it and if someone has an issue with it, just uh, we can reschedule uh async. Works for me. Sure. Okay. okay. So let's say uh, yeah, uh, January fourth. Okay. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.